a speeding bullet, uh, leaps tall buildings, and uh, comes in looking amazing. Uh, also extraordinarily talented, uh, who I've just had the privilege of working with on a pilot. Uh, amazing Ava DuVernay. And, One of my one of my good friends who in 2001 we had the privilege of working together on a movie we'd both like to redo, um, but uh, but he wrote it we produced it together so uh, we'll uh, we are proud of it in a lot of ways it was way ahead of his curve uh, prison song uh, he's also well he's also well known uh, as a cultural icon and for his music a tribe called. Quest. Please welcome Ava and Tim. Let's go. Woo! 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 Good? <laughs> yes! I'm good. Yeah? Yes. Good. Oh, green. Yes, I mean, you know, I'm from Cali. I took the red eye. Got, oh, West Coast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, came in, and, um, and yes, everything that could go wrong went wrong, but we are here, and I'm grateful. And hello, everyone. Hello. Well, first of all, for me, I uh, just want to congratulate you on all of your, you know, just the, the, the wave that's kind of been happening and you've been at it for a minute. This is something, you know, to a lot of people, uh, it's probably the first course with you, mm -hmm. but you, this is something that, that is who you are and that you've been doing for, for a while. Um, what was the, the point? Because, you know, I don't want to, like, do the whole kind of last mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that moment when you made the transition to being a writer-director, what was, was it a series of things? Mm -hmm. Was it, was it one thing in particular? Mm -hmm. Like, and what, what was the thing that happened that drove you to? Right, yeah. right. Well, I'm just... Thrilled. I met him two minutes ago as we were walking. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and as you're talking about kind of what drove me, as I'm looking in, in your face, I keep thinking about um, the very first time that I got to do anything as an artist was as a, as a, a UCLA student at this um, health food store called The Good Life in L.A. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, where there were a bunch of really, I guess it's like into your lyricist lounge here. Mm -hmm. um, back in the 90s, I feel old saying that. Uh. <laughs> but in the 90s, you know, the golden age of hip hop, and that was, you know, a time when I was a young poet and was, you know, um, just in that world. It was the first time that I was living with art because where I came up, uh, nobody was, you know, really thinking about art in that way. And so uh, I di directly related that to my first films because my very first film was a film called This Is The Life, right. which was all about the good life. Right. And so that, you know, early time of living as an artist. You guys should see it if you have sorry. Yeah, it's really, really yeah. uh, uh, underground cult classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but that early time, the time when I first got to just, you know, have creative energy around me and be with other artists every day and just what that vibe is really fed me so much so that when I had the opportunity to make my first film or I gave myself that opportunity, I chose to revisit that time. So I think, you know, when did the, when did the writing and directing camp come in? It really came in at the point when it was an alchemy, when there was a lot of creative energy around me. And I think that that's so important, you know, when you're starting out or even when you're, you're doing it, to surround yourself. Yeah. Find a trot. <laughs> <laughs> but find your people, you know, find the folks that are going to feed you and nourish you in a creative way. So, um, I don't know if that answered your question. No, that's it did, it did. And um, 
obviously, you know, uh, Hollywood is notorious for a lot of things, and, you know, um, it's no secret, you know, it's hard for us as African Americans to gain entrance and probably times that by a thousand for black women, mm. um, especially black women with vision and voice. Uh, how did you, I understand, you know, you spoke about, you know, your circle, your tribe, your circle of love and creativity that was around you. Um, was there any, I mean, because there was a period, because I, I think, um, between, what was the, the, I think it was maybe a third, the second film, there was this period of inactivity in me, it seemed like for two or three years. What was the longest period of inactivity, and was, was that ever due to kind of like, you kind of like having to push your shoulder to the wheel and mm -hmm. figure it out, like, mm -hmm. how much did that weigh on you and weigh on your artists? Right, right. Um, well, my motto is stay shooting. Hashtag stay shooting. If I could tattoo it, I would. But my mom said no more tattoos. So, um, so yeah, no, I'm always shooting. There's, there's not been since I started shooting any period of inactivity. Um, uh, in general, there might be gaps in films. Right. Okay. But I'm doing TV, or I'm doing a doc, right. or I'm doing a commercial, or I'm doing a video. Okay. Constantly shooting is what the goal is. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, but yeah, I think for me, I started as a publicist in the industry. Right, right. So I was a publicist for a lot of filmmakers, and I would see the struggle, especially for black filmmakers or people of color in general, and definitely women, and definitely women of color, this period of inactivity or this moment of trying to figure out, once you did it, how do you do it again, mm -hmm. within the construct of the industry. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I made my first film, my first feature film when I was 38. Mm -hmm. um, so it's never too late. Um, <laughs> that, uh, I, uh, I, I just uh, didn't, uh, I just started from the outside. And so I never uh, started work within the industry, within the architecture of the industry as we know it. So I did come up to a lot of resistance because I found my people and I started making films in my own space, in my own way. Now eventually those started to intersect with industry, uh, but that's you know, the first four films. Yeah. Um, you know, we're done completely independently, right. which is, you know, kind of the lifeblood of places like this, Tribeca and Sundance and South by Southwest and, uh, and, and, and Urban World and Langston Hughes and, and Pan-African Film Festival and all the festivals that really, um, uh, uh, yeah, someone's going to help her. Um, no, no, she's having a hard time. Um, uh, all the places that, uh, that nurture that independent spirit. So. I think um, I think you know that that's one of the things that I learned from Spike. Oh, it was always shooting twenty films in twenty years, yeah. but also docs, but also commercials, but also music videos, but working. also plays. Stay I working. mean, just yeah. stayed stayed working and stayed shooting, and that makes the muscle strong. Yeah. But it also you know that creative energy that energy that we're talking about, which yeah. is something I just really feel strongly about. You can't take it for granted that you have it. Mm -hmm. Like at post Selma, folks were like. Agents, some agents, some people were like, take your time, you know, make a ne your next choice, really think about what you want to do next, take you know your year off. That is, you it's know? funny you say that, because it's like, for me, not to put my thing in it, but for me, I I find that I, I have to kind of like, once I start, I can't slow down, mm. it's like, you have to just keep, like you said, keep the muscle right. Yeah. You know, sometimes you, like look at Woody Allen, like Woody Allen is yes. a massive, huge yes. amount of work. Yeah. You know, like you spoke about Spike. It's like, you know, you have to like keep it going and not kind of let all the other things right. come in. Right, if you want to. I mean, don't overexert yourself to the point that you're damaged, but if you are living your dream, which I am, and if you're in the thick of it and the window's open and the doors are wide open and you can breathe it in and do the thing, then why stop to make calculations about industry? Right. And so that's what was my thing after Selma. That's why I jumped into Jane Rosenthal, who introduced us, called and said, hey, do you want to come do a TV show? And folks were like, don't do a TV show. You were just at the Oscars. And I was like, I want to go shoot. You know, I'm trying to shoot, and I like the show. Well, I, I want to ask so, you about that because... Um, you know, it's a different process, you know, doing television and the, the film. And um, where do you feel like you have more freedom in a real way? Like, as just as, because sometimes with, 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 
what I've noticed is that when you do film, you know, you it's it's pro you know, it's your undertaking. So you have all these other things that you probably have to think about in a way you're kinda like the quasi producer in a way that not only do you write, you direct, you're also acting, you kinda just dealing with so much. Whereas with television you kinda like working underneath somebody else's kind of like thing in yeah, somebody else's like paradigm mm -hmm. you would and that could also put you as a director in a real uh, you know just working on that muscle specifically mm -hmm. you know what I mean mm -hmm. so which one do you feel right. how you, you have more right. liberation in? It's a great question. Um, I think the, the, the goal is to find liberation in whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. and that's hard. But the interesting thing is right now all the, 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 the paradigms are changing. Mm -hmm. You know, TV is not what it used to be. TV right. is now very much being embraced as an auteur's medium. Mm -hmm. and everyone from Steve McQueen to David, to David Fincher to uh, Soderbergh or uh, Jill Soloway. I mean, great, great filmmakers <laughs> are embracing television and making great stories. I mean, instead of a two-hour film, they're making a 13-hour film, yeah. but you're just seeing it weekly. And that's how folks are approaching it, and that's how I've approached the series that I'm working on uh, uh, for, for OWN uh, that I start shooting in the summer. Uh, but beyond that, you know, television in general, some of the episodic stuff I've done, like um, executive producing and creating the world for, for Jane's show, for Justice, or uh, working on Shonda's show, uh, Scandal. You are working in someone else's vision, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Right. You know right. what I mean? I, I, I don't know if I can liken it to, I don't know, you do a guest verse on someone's song? See? But, you know, I just, I am walking into their world and it's their decisions and you're trying to kind of get in where you fit in in that space. So that's doing the episodic directing, creating shows. Um, is its whole another thing. It's like film supersized. Right. You know what I mean? It's like instead of two hours, it's 13 hours, and I'm creating it, and I'm writing it, and I'm doing it, and I'm just doing it, and doing it, and doing it, because you're like, when is this shoot over? How many days is the shoot? Oh, 120 days shoot? Holy. Right. You know, um, so, so no, I think, I think now television and film are, are really, um, you know, competing for the attention of, of writer and directors yeah. now. And the other thing is once you start making films for studios, which I just had a little brush with on Selma. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've never... Speak. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was interesting because, uh, you know, I'm used to writing, directing, producing my own stuff, putting my own crew together. No one is telling me anything. Right, right. Except, you know, answers to specific questions that I have right, from you. Right. Then I want to hear, but what is your opinion? Tell me. But... <laughs> uh, tell me your opinion when I haven't asked you is the studio and so and so I think you know it was interesting to work in Selma I did have final cut on Selma so I always knew that the final vision would be mine which is really rare but you do have to work in a collaborative manner it's interesting to work in a collaborative manner with people who might not be used to working in a collaborative manner and so <laughs> I said it. Oh, you said it. You know, I mean, I think they know what they're talking about from their perspective, which is business. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, exactly. And, you know, my perspective is from the creative side right. of it, and so right. sometimes those two don't mix. But, um, so yeah, you know, I'm, I'm finding the blurred lines between indie film, studio film, episodic television, creating your own television. It's all gray, and it's, it's all kind of wonderful. Well, 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 let me ask you, do you uh, feel that um, you know, as a director, as, you know, obviously one who's a cinephile, such a thing, uh, it, do you feel that everything being put on the small screen, do you feel like, do you have your own, like, uh, I really like to see movies, like I like to go to the movies, I like to see things put in two hours, I like to see all that worked out, or are you a person who, you know, obviously you understand what television is, but is there one that, one medium that you prefer for the other? Do you feel like, you just said it's a, a beautiful kind of gray, do you feel like um, it's important to have differentiators? Um, like, how do you feel about 
the fact that over the past maybe 10 years, the television has just had, like, kind of almost taken, mm -hmm. you know, Hollywood by yeah. storm. You know? I think it's fantastic. Um, and I'm trying to tell all kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to someone about VR, virtual reality. I'm trying to do one of those. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> like a sky ride a movie, I would. I mean, you know, like, like any, all the new forms of storytelling is really what it is. I and mean, I think there's something with filmmakers that we become very precious about film. And just the sanctity, yeah, yeah, the sanctity exactly, of film, exactly. but ultimately it's about you know expression and the voice and the story and what you're trying to get across, the feeling, you know, the vibe, whatever you're trying to say. And I just I embrace that those things can be said and communicated in different ways. As a director, do you feel you know obviously? And I want to talk to you about the, the cinematography choices specifically for Selma because I, I just thought it was just so beautiful to look at, right? Yeah. What do you I'm just speaking, just speaking, being candid with you, being a bit intimate here. Like, and I'm just being honest, so don't take it wrong, but sometimes some people don't know how to capture African American or black or people of color. You know what I mean? Sometimes they, they, they make people look muted in a certain way. You get it, you know what I'm saying? It means <laughs> No, but uh, <laughs> so it's kind of like a, 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 a multi-tiered question. Yeah. But um, you know, having the ability to to paint, and you know, in the composition of certain shots, you know, as a director, mm -hmm. you look at it, you see how it's framed out, and then you you kind of think in cinematically, you think in how it looks on the big screen, mm -hmm. and not to beat the whole TV thing in, in the head, but. It may seem for some people a challenge of how you can have that same kind of, like when you actually make it and composing that shot, how it will look on, on television. Sure. Do you feel like that that's a hindrance for you? Do you look at that as a challenge as a, as a, <coughs> a, challenge as a director? Yeah. Do you look at it as a bad thing? Like, yeah, you... it's, a, it's a great question. Um, well, I have to give a shout out to anybody. I mean, you know I'm going to say Bradford Young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say Bradford. Who is my cinematographer extraordinaire? Um, they would vibe. If you anybody knows Bradford yeah. knows about Bradford, I think they'd have a good good time together hanging out. But anyway, he's a good brother, and um, and he is a, a you know a, a genius when it comes to the photographic image, particularly mm -hmm. the cinematic image, and particularly around uh, you know how we capture our tonality and yeah. skin tones yeah. and all of that, which is a very specific mm -hmm. conversation that we have ad nauseum every. Yeah, always. Um, you know, there's. I always say, you know, um, in our in my film, middle of nowhere, um, we we were playing with the idea of how black people look in dark rooms. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, when I go in my house at night, the lights not on, and what, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And so, so often, folks are afraid to put darker hues against darker backdrops because you don't. It's just going to be teeth and eyes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's not necessarily the case. And sometimes it is the case, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so really playing with all of that texture and all of that tone and, and what that means to deconstruct it and experiment with it. So we did that a lot on previous things. Um, this is our fourth project we worked on together. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so with Selma, it was just so deeply embedded in our you know love of our people, you know, the legacy of, of, the, of the civil rights movement, but mm -hmm. then also just we really were always playing with the idea of the black body and deconstructing that in all kinds of ways. So there's a, we, we were very uh, rigorous with our use of close-up, um, with our use of profile. Um, I, we like just a little bit of a rim of light just on, on the profile. You may not be able to see everything. There's a whole scene where there's two dark men, uh, David Oyelowo and um, Coleman Domingo, sitting in a dark jail cell. Right, right. And there's just a little peak of light. And this funny story, was the, that was our first day of shooting. So that was the first day was to go to the studio, and they were like, <laughs> <laughs> um, no joke, ordered extra dailies colorists to go in and like had money set aside to reshoot it, and me and Brad are like, that's what it's supposed to look like. You know what I mean? and eventually that's in the film. But, it, you know, no disrespect to them, but that, that image, just the image of two dark-skinned people sitting in a dark space was so startling mm -hmm. and rare. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. that it needed an extra daily's colorist, like just to see if is there information there? They call it information. <laughs> like if we want to turn it up, can we? You know what I mean? And Brad was like, yeah, there's information in there. <laughs> and the information was like the tip of the nose. Like, you could bear, like when you cranked it up, you can see like that. <laughs> But, I mean, the idea of, you know, it, translating that kind of photographic experimentation with how that really related to the narrative. I mean, at that point, in jails in the mid-60s, in the Deep South, you know, wasn't no pretty light coming in. You know what I mean? Like, how do you make that real? How do you make it dank? How do you make it feel like our reference was making it feel like the hull of a slave ship? Like, that was what we were trying to do. And so to do that, you can't be, like giving them an extra fill. Right? You know what I mean? You have to just go for it. Yeah, yeah, the beauty line. <laughs> but, um, you know, staying on summer for a minute, for a minute um, you gotta forgive me because I am looking a little bit. Yes, here. No but, um, like, we all know uh, what's going on in America currently. It's been been kind of happening. It's not new for us, but I think technology has caught up mm -hmm. to the deeds of the police. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's just everybody else is finding out right. about it. Like just last night, I was reading this morning in the Times that there was a 25-year-old, I don't know if you guys heard about this, in Baltimore. Yeah. What was his name? Freddie. Freddie. Yeah. yeah. Um, who was uh, had his spine, spine broken. Broke. He was running yeah. away from the cops. Um, well, he was running away. He wasn't. He, he was. He wasn't even running away from the cops. He was just running. Running. He he was. Yeah. He, they weren't pulling him over for anything. Yeah. Brother saw yeah. some cops and was like, right. "I'm gonna go I'm this gonna way. Go, yeah. I'm just gonna go over here." <laughs> and they saw him running and so pursued. Yeah. And then yeah. he ends up with a broken vertebrae and a, and a, what is it? Vocal box smashed. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. dead. And dead died Beautiful. in a coma a, a week later. Yeah. Um, but they arrested him and. It was cool when they put him in the van, so they don't really know how that happened. Yeah. The six but, cops in the back yeah. of the van. But anyway. Um, but so, yeah. You, you know, back when you were, when you were uh, making summer, um, did you have, what was your intent? Like, I mean, obviously, there's the, the creative and artistic, but, you know, just surreptitiously was it something that was just bubbling under like just speaking to you know where we are now as blacks in America with um, how we're valued, how our lives are valued, or lack thereof. Like, um, actually the irony I think in a way, you know, African American woman who's, you know, leading this artistic charge, speaking about like a great moment in American history, but then it colliding with what's happening today. Um, was all of that stuff like, you know, swirling around? Mm -hmm. um, was, no. there ever, was there ever any moments like, um, on top of that, was there ever any moments when you were like, on set where you were doing something that was really emotional that kind of like triggered like a whole bunch of thoughts or, or emotions about where we are today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this, this, uh, Mike Brown was murdered um, while we were in the editing room. So we had already shot the scene of Jimmy Lee Jackson being murdered in, in the, in Selma, in the, uh, in the restaurants. Um, and that, that's just historical. I mean, you said it at the top. It's not new. Mm -hmm. It's only now being captured and amplified for, you know, a national audience. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as black people in America, certainly <laughs> coming from where I come from in, in Compton, um, and just in general, I mean, we know that this stuff is an ongoing thing. So bringing that into every thought about how we were going to con construct Selma was definitely at the forefront, but it wasn't directly connected to any of these cases that have now garnered national attention. Um, you know, I wasn't thinking of, you know, mm -hmm. of Oscar Grant or anyone in particular. Um, I was just thinking of what my mission is and all of my work truly is to, um, you know, magnify the magnificence of black people, which is basically uh, a long way to say that black lives matter. 
there, really, before the hashtag. That was my my goal, was just in all of my work, you know, if, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? If the woman filmmaker doesn't take special care with the woman characters, who does it? Because it's not going to be the man. If the black filmmaker doesn't take special care with it, who's going to do it? It's not going to be the filmmaker who doesn't know it. You know what I mean? And there's some instances where special things shine through, but overall I feel um, that it's no one else's responsibility to make the things that I want to see. Right. Um, it's my responsibility, and if I want to see them, then I need to make them. Mm -hmm. If I'm able, then I am, so I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but yes, within Selma, you know, it was interesting. We were dealing with the echoes and the legacy of all of this trauma. And, you know, while we were in the editing room, it started to manifest in national headlines in a way that we could have, could have never imagined. And so, you know, I hope that people went into the film with a sense of, of urgency and immediacy about what they were seeing. I think if, if anything good came from the time that the film came out, what was going on in the nation was that people were watching the film not with a sense of hindsight, right. but with a sense of Selma is now and this is then and nothing's changed and wait, how far have we come? And those questions were not in a, a box with the patina of civil rights movement, mm -hmm. which is what we wanted to avoid. Yeah. Um, it just feels you know, like black people trying to live and breathe. Whether yeah. it's there or whether it's now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> just it's, it's you know, just from one artist to another. For me, and again, not trying to take it away, but I feel like like our work is so kind of like intertwined. You do? <laughs> you know, like, That's you, great. I mean, you love hip hop. You came up. You know what I'm saying? Hip hop. <laughs> I really love hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And I feel like. <laughs> yes. No, nah, but I feel like, um, you know, where we're at musically, it's like, like you said, it's important to. I say this a lot to like my team. You know, it's important to show and highlight. You know black brilliance, but also black complexity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be In awesome. music, in, especially yeah. in our music, like, mm -hmm. from what we're kind of doled out, mm -hmm. like, immediately, like, it's only a, f it's a very myopic kind of presentation. It's like, we are existing as musically, as people with money and Opulence yeah. and grand joys and not giving them back right. and I'll share you and I'll play you know the right. same old things right. and it just it's really uh, I wish that um, uh, that sentiment that you share could be funneled and fueled in a bigger way musically you know what, what I mean? What do you see now? I mean, what what music? I mean, certainly that's what. You do and what you've done, but I mean, what do you think of, is the state of things now? Because it's always been that element of the bling and the violence yeah. and that thing. That's but you're saying there's not a comprehensive view of who we are. Well, I, I think that there's people out there that's making stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's that's not certainly. Being, yeah, yeah, but it's not. And I think because of that, some people who have the chops and the wherewithal to kind of make more meaningful, deeper type of music tend to say, mm. right. Bills, I gotta pay bills. Right, right. Fuck the bitch. Right. You know what I mean? Right, right. So, right. But the same thing. Same thing with, yeah. with film. I mean, you know, we know the things that sells, and as, as far as being a black filmmaker, mm -hmm. it's comedy, it's action, you know, it's, it's those elements. The, you know, the quiet, you know, character drama, mm -hmm. you know, is not what the studios are paying you for. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're never going to get rich off of it, just like you're saying. Right. The MC that tries to speak about certain things will mm -hmm. be relegated to a certain place. I think the question as artists is, is it worth it? I mean, what, you know yeah. what I mean? Is it worth not the time? when you could say something and actually monetize it, and, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, not monetize it, but it be embraced by an audience big enough for you to live, mm -hmm. was, you know, was the time when Tribe was at its height. Mm -hmm. You know, could Tribe come out right now and, and hit? What do you think? No. You do not think. No. Say, okay, wait, Mid Midnight Marauders drops right now, <laughs> what happens? I, 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 you know, I, I think, 
I think that um, we we weren't really at those times. There was no compromise with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like we had a vision, and we just went. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you, it was such a young, still fertile time. You know, America was still kind of. It, it, and this is just in, in total. America was still getting, you know, still take, being able to look at black life, mm. whether it be through hip hop, through film, through sports, whether it was Michael Jordan, whether it was Martin Lawrence, a tribe, mm. or Far Side. You know, most of America was still saying, "Wow, they, they really," you know what I mean? Mm. So, and we weren't really concerned. It was more of an end thing, so we, there was no compromise. But I guess my 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 where I'm the point I'm getting to is is that you know there is you know a time where you may have to look at it and say may I, I may have to compromise this I may have to compromise that how important is it for you as a director as an artist to look at these things that may come up in front of you that you may feel be roadblocks to where you're trying to go, do you truly look at it as a compromise or do you look at it as a challenge? Like I'm trying to, to see if you look at it and if something comes to you and it's like totally like gnarly and something you don't want to do, do you try to find this, are you the type of person to try to find the silver lining in it and try to break it towards where you, you're at or do you just like say no? Right, no I just say no. <laughs> because, because it's too hard. I mean making a film is, Hard. I mean, you know, some of you in here have done it or are trying to do it. It is, uh, I mean, you know, two nights ago, I mean, Jane's shaking her head. I mean, I was just in the, the sound mix. Just I had a sound mix going, a VFX session going. Uh, uh, the composer was in the other room. The editor's in the room. It's three in How the morning. How many hours? Three in the I mean, we're, were you working seven, at seven all, I mean, when I say seven all-nighters, that means go home, take a shower, like, get a quick meal maybe two hours and go, and back. go right back because we were on a crazy deadline mm -hmm. um, but it's too hard the way that I make films it's too hard to do something that you don't you, love if, you, yeah. if, if there's something that you're doing right. Right. It's just, there's just no amount of money like for example on this this piece that I was doing this pilot uh, I'm on set I'm feeling good I'm really I, I really <laughs> like this piece there's something in the piece that I want to say I, there's something in this piece that I want to be on television it's about this elite group of, uh, of, uh, of freedom fighters. They work for the DOJ, and they're a combination of lawyers and FBI agents, and every week they solve a different civil rights abuse. So it's like every week the country would be able to see a, a case solved about anti-Muslim sentiment, or a case solved that something around Ferguson, or a case solved that something around a transgender murder, or whatever, but these elements in the, 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 the umbrella of a procedural um, you're actually able to give middle America or whomever is watching some information about people on the outside, people on the margins, right? And so I love the idea of that. But at the point that it's 2 in the morning, I'm in New York in a snowstorm doing a night exterior, I'm thinking, there's no amount of money. <laughs> like, where's Jane? I need a raise. You know what I mean? Like this. Like this. Why am I here? What, and so, and, and what the answer was, is because I have to tell the story. But if the answer was because you need a check, there's no amount of money to do something you don't want to do. So, um, so yeah. I hear that. Yeah. I, I'm used to not having. I'm used to not having a lot of money. So, and you know, making stuff indie. So you know, I mean, what do you really need besides yeah. besides, besides being married to your your, your vision? Yeah. So I mean, being being very you know. Uh, uh, in, in, a, in a loving, happy marriage with your vision. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Be very, you know what I mean? Just like very, you know, in love with what you're doing. I yeah. think that's the key. And I think people can tell the audience, you know, something about the energy with which things are made is transmitted to the audience. Mm -hmm. I can watch a film and tell if it's made with joy. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Or made with some passion. I, I really, I feel like I'm turning my back to the side, sorry. But made with some the spirit of that artist or the artists who came together. I can watch a film and, and, and some of that transfers to you. Yeah. And the very best films are that way. Who are some of your, your favorite directors? Uh, 
director? Uh, I am a big uh, Ang Lee fan. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big Haile Garima fan, Julie Dash. Um, you know, to say you're a fan of black filmmakers, unfortunately, um, is to say that you're a fan of maybe two or three films. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're not, um, you know, we don't have a Woody Allen. Right. Or a Mike Nichols. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, our filmmakers uh, are not making films into their old age right. with all of the wisdom and experience that they've yeah. garnered. Um, and that's a, that's a truly sad thing. I mean, our greats, Haile Garima, you know, mm -hmm. Julie Dash, mm -hmm. Charles Burnett, mm -hmm. Ezra and Paul C. They're not making films right now because mm -hmm. they can't. They cannot get it together. They cannot yeah. get the support and resources together mm -hmm. to continue to have their voices heard mm -hmm. in this time of their life when there's so much for us to hear. Yeah. So when you look at, you know, you know, I mean, Cindy, Cindy Lumet was making films until, you know, couldn't make them anymore. Right. Right. And uh, and so that is the comment on on not just black filmmakers, but filmmakers of color in general in this country. Yeah. Uh, there's no uh, long legacy for any of our filmmakers for us to be able to see them mature into mm. into their later years. Yeah, and that's the benefit of it. Shame too. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's maybe maybe the new I mean, who's next? Like First of all, it's not too late for us to support these filmmakers and for them to be able to make their films. But Julie Dash has, has a, 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 a crowdfunding campaign going right now, Julie Dash, on um, Indiegogo. Indiegogo. Um, and she, that sister, should be able to make another feature film since Daughters of the Dust. Right. That was shot crazy, too. Right. That was shot crazy. In the cinematography. Arthur Joffa. AJ. AJ. Who was AJ. Bradford Young. Crazy. Bradford Young, my cinematographer. Oh. That's his teacher. AJ yeah. shot. Did you know AJ? Yeah, I know AJ. He, he shot on something. Oh, he did? <laughs> he was our second film. Really? Yeah. He's yeah. dope. <laughs> AJ, I know he shot. Um, Kubrick got him. Oh yeah. Eyes wide yeah, 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 it's bad. It's bad. Um, <laughs> sorry, side note, AJ Arthur Jaffa, look him up too. Um, but uh, yeah, AJ actually directed a film, uh, a documentary, a really beautiful doc mm -hmm. that um, that he's working on called Dreams Are Colder Than Death. Mm -hmm. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good film. So anyway, um, but yeah, no, just the idea of legacy around our filmmaking is, is something that's really important. And so mm -hmm. I think part of that is loving what you do, trying to create a canon of material. Not to say I'm immune to any kind of pressures. There's a project right now that, there's a couple projects that have been floating yeah, around that. speak on, on, on what you got. Like, no, you know, no. As much as you, as much as, much as, as you like, yeah, there's projects out there right. that on the face mm -hmm. would look, I would, it would look like uh, that's never something that she would do. Um, but there's something about it that, you know, <laughs> that that I think speaks to what I want to say. Um, and so I think we need to keep ourselves open to that as well, the unexpected, yeah. mm -hmm. and to taking different turns. You know, when Spike started directing, um, you know, st uh, uh, he would do, when, when he did Kings of, didn't he? No, not Kings of Comedy. He did something crazy. I remember the first time it was, was it? What, she hate me? Kings of Comedy? No. <laughs> what, did you say? what was it? Kings of Comedy? Yeah, yeah, he did Kings of Comedy, and he's, you know, he, he started doing, like, live concert, and, you know, you, you think of him as one thing, you know, if you take away all of Spike's narrative films, and you just look at his docs and live work, like, that is the work of, like, a whole other filmmaker's career, just right. the docs, right. you know, just the live stuff, just the commercials. Mm -hmm. I know I continue to reference him, but I do it because he took left turns, and he did what interested him, and he didn't keep himself in any kind of box, he just continued to shoot, and follow his interests. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that's also something that I want to make sure um, I try to stay flexible and not get, you know, after some, uh, I don't know, like nine civil rights scripts. <laughs> and, I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, no, no civil rights, I'd say. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, no civil rights. How about this? This takes place in the 20s. <laughs> Racism. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not, this yeah. is the first fighter pilot of this. This is the, I said, okay, well, how about this? Uh, no civil rights for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no period pieces. Right, 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 no right. first of anything. Right, right. What, what else is out there? Crickets. You know what I mean? Like, it's not a lot else happening that's coming across the desk at this point. So. Yeah. The romantic comedy. You had a romantic comedy, weren't you? I was. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, you were, you were, you were, you were, no, you were, you were in a good romantic 
kind of comedy. Weren't you in something with my friend Gina Bryce? Oh, yeah. Uh, they were the cool producer. Disappearing Act. Disappearing Act. Yeah, with Sanan Weston. She was trying to make a song, but the producer wouldn't. Well, you wouldn't give her her tracks? You locked up her tracks or yeah. something? And then she was me and then Big Kung Fu fight. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 I remember that. <laughs> you don't have to ask me. Oh, I'm waiting for you. I have witnesses. I have witnesses. But yeah, is that of interest though? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Was this a dabbling? Because at one point, every MC was like, I'm going to get my yeah, hat Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, that's the <laughs> thing. That this, that's because yeah. this is a thing that people probably, it's an inside thing, right? Yeah. So, um, I came up in this crew, the Native Tongues, right? Mm -hmm. And um, one of my close buds was this guy, Africa, who was in this group, the Jungle Brothers. I like how he's talking about it like we all know. Uh, well, <laughs> he was actually, and my manager here, Mike Austin, was sitting in the front. He, um, they did this film, and it was the first film that featured a rapper, and he starred in it, and I can't remember it. The dude who was in, um, what's the Queen Latifah living single? The dude who was the dark skin dude with the dreads. Uh, and, uh, oh, T.K. Carter. Yeah. yeah, and what was the name of that movie? Um, yeah. Oh, Nina, oh, Nina, Nina, Nina Shaw's right in the middle. You probably represented that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I can't remember, but it's... Yeah. T.K. Carson, one of those... T.K. Carson and Linda Lars. T.C. Linda Lars. T.C. Mike Carson. Well, anyway, well, Africa was in this A classic. He was in this movie. Okay. This is before Pac did it. Okay. And he and I used to talk about doing film all that stuff and wanted to do film and all that stuff. And then um, I uh, got a call from um, John Singleton and he wanted me to do the lead in what was the movie I was seeing? Oh, yeah, Justice? Yeah. He wanted me to do the lead but I was like, nah, I, I, I can't. I can't do it, just give me a small part. He was like, you sure? Because I'll give you the smallest part ever. Said, no, 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 no. And he gave me the smallest part. No, but it was purpose. the best part. Weren't you the boyfriend who died? Yeah. Oh. 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 But no, because it was important. Let me tell you why from a filmmaker's perspective. Justice. Janet Jackson with the Dookie Brains. Yeah. <laughs> Justice was devastated. Why? You had to give her a reason to be devastated. If you're going to lose this, you're going to be devastated. For the whole movie. You can't be someone you're shaking and be like, girl, get over it. Like, we were with her, in her, you know. And she was like looking at your picture of whatever was happening. So, but, but, but in both instances, I felt like, I, I felt, you see, I'm talking to <laughs> uh, this is, you know, I felt like, man, I had it, but I didn't do it. Like, I've always, and this is like a fault of mine, I had like this, this youthful preoccupation with trying to be the first to do it. I was young right. and stupid, whatever. Right. I didn't know much. So then after I, I, I did it, um, Fishburne, who was a dear big brother mm. to me, I seen him, um, we did, he did, they did a, a test of it or whatever, or he's seen it or something, I ran into him, he was like, you're good. <laughs> I was like, God, uh, good. He says, you think I'm lying to you? And he got really serious. <laughs> he's like, if I'm telling you, you're good. 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 Did you? So I did. I okay. went to uh, HB. Yeah. Um, yep, I went to HB. I also studied at Black Nexus with Susan Batson. For, yeah. I, studied at, I studied at HB for like two years and I studied with Susan for like three oh, or four Susan years. Batson. And then somebody went like this to the bodega, the bodega gate, and all the rappers came running through. <laughs> I'm in the business. <laughs> <laughs> because 
realized it was getting too crowded and the space wasn't being taken seriously. Yeah, but then I had this idea to do this thing about, you know, young men getting incarcerated. So I um, came up with an idea and I wrote it along with Darnell Martin, who's another talented yeah. yeah. uh, sister. And um, it was going to be a musical, and it's not really music, but mm. not really like a breakout, like, mm. oh, I'm in prison. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, you know what I mean? It's going to, like, try to do it. And it's called Prison Song. And Jane, that track record, and um, Bob took a liking to it and, and bought it. And yeah. we did it at New Wine, and it didn't really go, go anywhere. But, you know, it's fun because you got to, I got to, you made scrape it. Your elbow. It was something we made, yeah. you know? And you got to sc scrape your elbows a little bit right. and kind of bruise your knees a little mm -hmm. bit and mm -hmm. get it into it. But yeah, it's something that, especially when you see like work like yours that you know like all of this great amount of work and the sweat went into it, but when you see the piece, you don't, you don't see the work. Like, I mean, you don't see the mechanics. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like, for me, I don't like when I look at a film and I can see and I see that it's directed. Like, you shouldn't even... Sometimes, like, certain directors who are awesome directors, they get into doing these little tricks and then they just throw it in. You know it's them sometimes. Yeah. And it becomes kind of yeah. and it becomes kind of yeah. sloppy. Yeah. I like kind of, for me personally, a seamless kind of, like, integration of what you're trying to do as a director and how you're melding with the stories and the characters. Mm -hmm. How much time like, do you spend working with the actors? Because it, it seems like, you know, that you're a, a director who cares about that. I've noticed that, you know, some of the, you, use, you know, you use certain cats throughout your films, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Do you feel like when you have an actor and you have a, synergy with them. You know, certain directors are like, you know, just read the line, I picked the camera there, I wrote, wrote it this way. Certain directors, like a Spike, likes to rehearse mm -hmm. two, three weeks before. Like, what is your mm -hmm. um, place with the actors? Well, I love actors. I think there's some directors who just truly, truly don't love the actors. Mm -hmm. um, they love the camera more, mm -hmm. um, which is not a bad thing. Uh, it's just, I mean, when I sit down and talk to directors, I'll ask them if you had to choose. Sophie's Choice, mm -hmm. the camera that, like, if you could make a film with no actors, would you? You know what I mean? Or if you could, if you could make a film with no camera, mm -hmm. <laughs> would you? And, um, and so for me, it, it's all about the actors. I really love working with actors. Um, I have a, a deep respect for them because uh, I can never do it. Um, and so when I'm asking an actor to do something or to say something or to give a part of themselves, I'm asking them to do something that I'm not brave enough to do myself, and so I have respect for that. Um, and no, I just enjoy uh, collaborating and building and shaping a character with, 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 with another artist. Um, the challenge is that on independent films, there's no time, there's not a lot of time to rehearse. Mm -hmm. um, but I always like to just, I like to say, just kiss it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we can't like have a full session. Mm -hmm. But we can just have a kiss. You know, just kiss the scene, just a quick, just the, are we on the same page about what this is before you get to what set? What is kissing? You know, it, it can happen in a bunch of different ways. It can happen with, um, with just a conversation about it. It can happen with, uh, you know, just you know, just reading it and just seeing how it feels out in the world, the words feel out in the world. Maybe if there's enough time, you try to get it on its feet and get some movement around it. Um, you know, just different rehearsal techniques, but ultimately, it's uh, about making sure that we both have a, a similar idea of what the scene is before we get there on the day, so that we're being uh, time efficient on the day uh, and not trying to work out major problems on the set. Yes, yeah. but I mean, because at a certain point, like, I'm sure if you hadn't already, you may run into, like, actors who may feel like, kind of like the adverse of what directors feel like, like that they're the ones who really are carrying it. There's some actors who are notorious for right, not but even I don't cast them. them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't cast them. I try to, to cast uh, and invite people to work with me who have the same attitude about the work. I mean, you, 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 the, those actors are known, the ones mm -hmm. that you're talking about, mm -hmm. 
and um, and and usually you can sit down with someone and get a sense of their vibe. Yeah. A couple have slipped through, um, but, uh, but I'm not afraid to, to tell you how I feel That's good. at any point That's on the good. set. So I, I just really don't tolerate bad behavior, and I don't think that the actor is above uh, the grip right. or above exactly. the other crew members. And I was about to ask you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, somebody's acting fool or acting up, yeah. you know, I'm like, that guy was on yeah. set. Two hours before you even got here, yeah. it's going to be your two yeah. hours, and you, out of respect, yeah. we need to get exactly. this down. So I think, um, but I think, you know, you try to create a, a, a familial quality on the set, and part of that is the way that you curate the people that you work with. I know early on when I was working, it's so much about who will work for me and with me for no money. Mm -hmm. didn't have any. Um, but ultimately what I found is that's never worth it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's always because you're going to have bad apples and bad energy on set. Right. So keep the crew smaller and make sure that no matter what you're doing, you have people who want to be there and who you want to be there with because it's too hard to be done. I mean, you're not just the directing the film, you're directing the crew and the set yeah. and everything. It's like even down to like craft services. Yeah. You, know, you have to make sure that everybody is cool. Well, you're you directing an experience. Yeah. That's how I see it. You know what I mean? The experience of it. Yes, we're making the film and that was well, that that is what lives on from this experience that we all had. Like, I really don't like people who leave any kind of work with me feeling like that was a waste of time, that was a bad experience, or I feel bad about that time I gave. So they're giving their time, they're giving their talent. So I think um, I'm trying to create an overall experience. It's like you're throwing a house party. You just want all yo, the elements. Yo, can I tell you, yo, I went to, uh, I went to go visit uh, Leo on um, Django. Oh, Leo. So, <laughs> so, but you know, he's like, that's my, that's my, that's your boy. That's my, that's my, I, I, that's my, we know him as Leonardo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, we know who you mean. <laughs> so, so, I went to visit him, right? So, they were doing a um, scene where they come into Canyonland or whatever. So, Jamie's there, he took it or whatever. So, then, they, they break or whatever, and, He's like, in between scenes, Tarantino was like playing like Cream and James Brown. Like, mm. everybody on the crew was just like happy. It's hot as hell. You can tell they've been right. busting the ass. Right. And, and then when they had to break the scene, they had to set up another scene. He's like, okay, we, what, what's the real? Because we're close to 100. Okay, 100. So it was 100, I guess, 100 uh, reels or something like mm. that. So... He had like this whole margarita thing come out and they were playing music, drinking margaritas, everybody, like wow. everybody out there, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it was just, it was, easy. Yeah, like, it was crazy and I was like, I didn't understand how he could go work without being drunk. And so, it was heavy handed. Right. <laughs> but it was, to, to, to your point, you know, it's a, it's an experience, and um, I think, like you said earlier, it shows up on the screen. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And it totally shows up in all your work. The joy, the the connection to the work, um, your heart is in it, and um, your fearlessness is in it. You just feel it, and it's a, it's a symmetry. Like it's just really beautiful. It's a subtle. It's a, it's a it's a it's a subtlety that you have, but it's powerful. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, I hope that uh, you rushing over here wasn't. Too, no, too. it was very it was very much worth it. Is that it? No, we're gonna open up. Are we gonna do questions? I yeah, was we're like, gonna oh, do some questions. Okay, cool. no, so I, I just, I just wanted to get my bag. You know what I mean? Brother just went. Okay, fantastic. Okay, fantastic. Appreciate, appreciate. Thank you yeah. very much. For so we're gonna take some questions from folks. Uh, this young lady right here in the blue. Well, let's start. Let's start right with that young lady, and then right up. Uh, no, no, no. To your left, right there, right here. Her. And then, yeah, blue okay, scarf cool. and then blue shirt. Um, hi, my name is Charlotte Casey, and I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much. Um, it's really nice and refreshing and exciting and inspiring to see myself in someone uh, that's achieved so much and is making amazing art. 
Um, and I just wanted to ask you if you had any tips for writer's block, um, or like getting out of your own way, so to speak, um, in terms of trying to create something. Yeah. Thank you for the kind words. Good energy. I appreciate it. Um, I uh, really am renowned for hating writing. Um, really, it's 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 bad. Like I have writer's block really bad. I have writer's block right now. I'm on deadline, and they think I've written some stuff. As <laughs> far along as it should be, truly. And so I'm struggling with that. What I found, I'm just going to be honest and real with you. It is uh, that procrastination, I've embraced it, and embraced it as a part of the writing process. I'm not ready to write right now, you know what I mean? And it's going to get done, and it's going to get done when it should, but there's something about, for me, the hectic energy of the end of it that really pushes me forward. And, and for me, that it, the lesson in that is everybody's different, you know what I mean? Ryan Coogler, a friend of mine, one time I called <laughs> Yes, he's right. He's right. One time I called him. Where are you? What are you doing? Oh, at the coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you on deadline? What's, what's up? What are you doing? No, I'm no, just, you know, getting my ride on, having a good day, got my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, is it something specific you're writing? Oh, yeah, that thing I was talking about. Like, it's going well. I've got pages. Like, just. <laughs> writer's block is I can't write well alone. I like to be like, like he was in a coffee shop. I, I find most writers, or a lot of writers, it helps to have energy around you. It helps me. Or yeah, judging, like the judgment <laughs> helps. <laughs> but yeah, like coffee shops or public places or like, you know, or um, library or just another writer in the room um, helps me. Good luck. There's no one way. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Savannah. Um, I wanted to ask you, first of all, I just wanted to tell you first, um, how amazing it is to get to see you really blossom in your career. Um, I grew up not getting to see too many women become filmmakers, and um, when I was a kid I wanted to be an actor because I thought that's the only thing girls could do in movies, mm -hmm. and um, it's really, really amazing to get to look up and get to see you there in the Oscars and, and really get to watch that blossom. It's a very great um, pathway, hopeful. <laughs> um, in that aspect, I did want to ask about um, being a woman in, in this field. Um, it's gotten a lot better over the years, but I think that there's still um, some rough spots. Um, how did you find that you kind of navigated through, um, especially being an African-American woman, um, the certain things that a little bit were more male dominant. How mm -hmm. did you feel like you kind of worked your way through them and, and found mm -hmm. the end?